to my very dear friends, um, Michael and Debbie Jenkins, who I love and admire. Uh, Michael extended this invitation to me many months ago to uh, stand in this place and be with you on this grand occasion. Um, and I, I want to say to you how uh, sorry I am that Michael is ill, yet and still I know that uh, he is uh, fully present in spirit. And it is an awesome thing to uh, stand in the space uh, where he and others who are responsible for this institution and its program uh, stand and function so well. Debbie, thank you. Uh, to the trustees and faculty and staff of this great institution, um, to the honorees, awardees who we have just celebrated. Uh, to Dr. Carol Cook, who gave a remarkably sensitive and wise sermon this morning during the baccalaureate service, uh, and to the members of this 2016 graduating class of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And I do hope that you are aware that even though I'm Atlanta, I know how to say Louisville. <laughs> I bring you greetings from your sister institution, Johnson C. Smith Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia which not unlike those of you who are graduating today is embarking on an exhilarating, uh, challenging, exciting new phase in its own theological and practical formation. Uh, many congratulations to you um, on reaching this exciting milestone in your journey. And uh, so what I've come to say to you today basically can be summed up in in uh, a few words. Come on, people. That's not quite it. <laughs> Come on, people. Now let's get in formation. <laughs> Come on, people. Now let's get in formation. Now, I, I know that that has no relevance. <laughs> It has no meaning to, to some of you. Um, um, and, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to all of that. If you'll just hold that in suspension, we're going to pray now. <laughs> Holy God, we thank you for your goodness to us, for the many ways that you function in our midst. We thank you for this great day. Uh, for this commencement service and for the lives and ministry and witness of these who are walking across the stage today. We thank you for this commemoration of the Pentecost, that occasion in which your Holy Spirit came powerfully and mightily upon your people. And we thank you for these preaching moments and pray that you will use them to the glory of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And so on this concept of formation, I was more than a little interested uh, during the baccalaureate service today by the yes lords and have mercies I heard uh, echoing around the chapel when Dr. Cook mentioned CPE and field study and internship and other pieces of the formational puzzle that we broadly call theological education. Dr. Cook, had you kept going uh, with that list of formational activities. I'm sure you would have gotten um, more than some hallelujahs, probably a few holy neck rolls and some other types of tuning. Uh, our reactions speak to the complexities of the process of formation. The scripture readings for the morning do this too. The Genesis passage offers an ancient theological framing about the origin of the diverse languages that we speak, that human beings speak around the globe. In the text, the offspring of the great flood and their generations, all of whom speak a common language, arrive at a place called Shinar. They gather, 
they agree, they organize themselves, they embark on formational processes by uh, 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 an intent to build a city. But a disruption occurs. God confounds their speech and somehow they no longer are able to accomplish their task together. Instead of remaining together as a formed community, they scatter, thus populating the rest of the earth. Now, one of the beautifully sad truths of this text, which I think is often overlooked by the modern reader, is that human beings, far too often, rather than do the difficult work of learning how to communicate with one another across the lines of difference, often opt out. We jet. We leave. We're out. Married couples can't work through their disagreement. They're out. Republicans and Democrats can't agree on policy and process and budget. They're out. Even if the session is in, still they're out. <laughs> Church members can't agree on the color of the new carpet in the sanctuary or on the padding in the pews. They're out. Oh, imagine what we could do if we had just a little more staying power. Author H. Jackson Brown wrote, in the confrontation between the stream and the rock, the stream always wins. Not through strength, but by perseverance. By contrast, the Bible also gives us this amazing account of Pentecost in which a different sort of disruption occurs. Not the kind that scatters the people, but the kind that brings the people together in profound new ways. You heard the text read beautifully, thank you so much. In that story, the people are in wait they have gathered in a place and they are to expect something. They're in anticipation. They don't know quite what to expect, but they are gathered and are in wait. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them powerfully and suddenly they are given the ability to speak in ways they've never spoken before. And according to the text, the people who hear this newfangled speaking understand it in their own native languages. It's not their native tongue that's being spoken and yet they can hear it in their own language. And the text speaks powerfully about the nature of God's Holy Spirit to bring people together around common understandings despite the differences in the languages they speak. In the aftermath of that story, in the aftermath of the, of, the, of the Pentecost event, the people suddenly are able to be together in ways that they had not been together, even though they're different. They're able to be together, to make community together, to be formed together. And if you read these chapters that follow the second chapter of Acts, what you find is a gathered community that's able to share. They share their resources, they share their food, they share their finances, they worship together, they share the common space, and if anyone had need, it is satisfied by the abundance of someone else. And because of this Pentecost event, You and I now, especially you, are able to embark on a formational process of faith that will have profound impact on generations to come. And in fact, because of what happened at Pentecost, the church universal has had 2,000 plus years of profound impact on the world. It didn't just happen. Pentecost is not some isolated event that just happened. It didn't just happen. And Peter, who sort of becomes the hero in the story, he didn't just happen upon it either. 
his arrival, his inclusion in the Pentecostal event was actually years in the making. Peter didn't get there except that he met Jesus with Andrew, James, and John fishing by the Sea of Galilee. Peter didn't get there except that he became personally invested with Jesus at a deeper level when Jesus visited his house and cured, healed his mother-in-law. He didn't get there except that after a long night of unsuccessful fishing, Jesus assisted him in making the most profitable catch of his life. He didn't get there except that he walked on water and was buoyed by Christ when he sank. He didn't get there except that he was named the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. He didn't get there except that he rebuked Jesus and in turn was rebuked by Jesus. He didn't get there except by the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't get there except that he was corrected by being trigger, for being trigger happy when he took out his sword and cut off the ear of a servant. He didn't get there except that he denied Jesus three times. He didn't get there except that he grieved the death of the Savior. He didn't get there except that he and Mary Magdalene and the other women exhibited the courage to go to that tomb, exhibited the courage to peer into that tomb. exhibited the clarity of mind to acknowledge that the cloths were on the ground and Jesus was not there. He didn't get there except for an on-the-road encounter with the risen Christ. It's a formational process that led this man and his colleagues and his peers to the point of Pentecost. Don't take my word for it. Someone else makes this point very well. Her name is Beyonce. So if you're my generation or older and you don't know who Beyonce is, <laughs> that's okay, no worries. Uh, but for the sake of this sermon, um, it's important and it's not inappropriate to say that Beyonce is to today's pop culture what uh, maybe Diana Ross was to pop culture of the 1960s and 70s. Did that help? Beyonce is a Texas-born African-American singer, songwriter, record producer, and actress who in the 1990s rose to fame as the lead singer of an R&B group called Destiny's Child, one of the best-selling girl groups of all time. When the group disbanded, Beyonce pursued a solo career that catapulted her into iconic fame and fortune. She has won all kinds of awards, and Forbes magazine listed her as the most powerful female musician of 2015. She has blazed all kinds of trails and continued to do so just this past February with a release of a record called Formation. Now, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm not a musician, but that never stopped me. So in, in this tune, Beyonce says, 
my daddy Alabama, my ma Louisiana. You mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. I like my baby air with baby hair and afros. I like my Negro nose with Jackson 5 nostrils. <laughs> And then she punctuates all of that with, okay, ladies, now let's get in formation. Okay, ladies, now let's get in formation. There, there you go. All right. Now, before you pull out your phones and go looking it up, <laughs> be forewarned. The lyrics are crude and crass and obscene and beautiful and vivid and provocative. The themes are feminist, womanist, southern, and matriarchal, not patriarchal. Matriarchal. The tones are twangy and repetitive. The rhythms are staccato and blunt. The imagery is bold and broad, bodacious, but common. And all of these play out in the song itself and in the video without judgment. And this is key because human beings are so quick to rush to judgment. But all of this, all of this imagery and this language plays itself out without judgment in what I like to think of as a montage of images with the beautiful grit of the human experience embedded within it. The words, my daddy Alabama, mama Louisiana, you mix that Negro with that Creole Mecca, Texas Bama, those words intriguingly describe her own parentage. But there's a bigger picture Beyond her immediate family origin, Beyonce is weaving together various aspects of Southern culture and history. She creates a tapestry rooted in the experience of the African, -American, uh, of African Americans, juxtaposing that which is crude and troubling alongside that which is inspiring and lovely and breathtaking. And she situates these images firmly within the wider society that we refer to as America. Said another way, Beyonce is describing the nature of formation. What she is saying, I believe, is that we are formed, that we arrive at this particular point in time in this country, on this planet, by means of formational processes, for better or for worse, that we are who we are today because we are the product of those who have come before us and the work that they did or did not do. Yes. That we arrive here by the making of the hands of those who have preceded us. And it's not by accident. We didn't just pop out, we're not just here by happenstance, we are here by virtue of something and someone, someones who have helped to shape us and define our experience, our perspective, and our understandings. And so it's commencement. How wonderful that your commencement was scheduled to coincide with the day of Pentecost. Who did that? That's awesome. Those people, those faithful few that we read about in that Pentecost story who were gathered together waiting for the Holy Spirit arrived at the place, at that place, by virtue of a process, a formational process. They didn't just show up, nor did you. You got information. And the 
the challenge ahead of you now is not merely to get called, not merely to get called to a church with a steeple or a white picket fence or an endowment or a prime location or a prominent pulpit or an established route to a bigger and better call. The challenge for you as ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to engage in the type of formational processes that carry this country forward, that carry the church of Jesus Christ forward, that carry this world to places of greater good. It's up to you to serve congregations and other communities in ways that improve their vitality and nourish their souls. It's up to you not only to preach the word, but to live the word in ways that draw others into the community of Christ. It's up to you, like those at Pentecost, to build bridges of unity across the lines of difference. It's up to you to be a mediator, as Christ is our mediator, praise be to God, that works for the reconciliation of body to body, heart to heart, mind to mind, and spirit to spirit. It's up to you to be a conduit for grace, peace, mercy, and justice. It's up to you to interpret so that all can hear and receive the truth in love. It's up to you, my friends. It's commencement. Now let's get in formation. Okay, people, now let's get in formation. Okay, people, now let's get in formation. Okay, people, now let's get in formation. <laughs>